My name is Cy Venom, and I'm a developer advocate with AWS. A lot of you might know me from my days at IBM. Uh, I'm the guy that does the uh, Lightboard videos. Uh, well, I was a big fan of OpenShift back then, and it's still following me. I just can't shake this thing. Uh, but all jokes aside, I am a big fan of OpenShift, and today we've got an exciting demo and presentation ready for you. Uh, so again, we're going to be talking about app modernization on AWS with the focus on Broza, that's Red Hat OpenShift on Amazon Web Services. But uh, I do have a couple of really cool demos lined up. But first, I'm going to pass it to uh, my co-speaker, Javier, to introduce himself. And he's going to do the first part of the presentation today. OK, thank you, Sai. My name is Javier Naranjo. Uh, I'm doing the business development for AWS in Iberia. And today we are going to talk about uh, what I said, uh, how do we see modernization based on the experience of, of our customers, and, uh, and also explaining a little bit about ROSA, how we position it, which is the added value, and, and so on. So uh, first of all, let's take a look to what our customers are asking. So when we are facing projects, when we are facing uh, partners, what they say is the main four things that our customers are asking for, first of all, is to build applications, not to take so much care about the infrastructure, because actually they are looking for an infrastructure that is managed infrastructure. Of course, they want to scale quickly, because when we are talking about modernization, it's not only that you are creating application and features in a quick way, in a fast way, you also need to scale it in a, in a very quick way. And of course, everything that they want to do and that we are doing in AWS actually is around security. Okay? So everything that we do had to do with, the, with security also. When we are building that application, we have to take a look to which are the key features of a modern application, what we call also cloud native application. And this is a scale to million of users, has a global availability, because actually every single feature that we want to deliver needs to be available for everybody inside a company, or if we are talking about a service that is for our customers, then to, to our final users. Being able to respond in, even in milliseconds, because actually every time that we are talking about the modern application, we are talking about two facts. First is uh, uh, velocity, how quick you are, and the other is how you are saving costs. So this is key when we are talking about modern application, and of course, uh, also the, that cloud native application is still is working with a lot of data, so we need to have that into account. The white boxes with the, with the blue uh, letters that you see over there is just the benefit of the modern application. Okay, so luckily we are just answering to the questions to our customers because actually with each of any of the features that we see, you see over there, we are satisfying the fast that you see around return of investment, cost, TCO, increasing the business agility, of course the customer experience, the user experience is key for us also, and increasing the efficiency of the developers because we are providing global tools in order that they can use it to create their applications, and they are able not only to create in a quick way, but as far as we are working aligned with DevOps, it's not only creating the application in a quick way, but also being able to operate it in the day two, also in a, in a modern scenario. What kind of workloads have, are using our customers for containers? Of course, applications, and this is the kind of applications you see over there. We are talking about web interfaces, we are talking about uh, backends, we are talking about EOT, data processing, but around, we see also stuff regarding operational expertise, and then we are focusing in stuff like platform as a service, things like that, in which we are providing CI, CD, uh, solution, uh, infrastructure as a service, solution around management, security, governance of the, of the stuff that we are creating. Uh, of course, what we are doing when we are modernizing sometimes is doing that lift and shift, not only modernizing. So we have to take care about moving applications, legacy applications, even like .NET, Linux, stuff that our customers are using on-premise and they want to use it in a modern way in the, in the cloud. And of course, all around machine learning because actually I think every modern company that is trying to create a modern solution is focusing on that kind of stuff. What we see in our customers when they are modernizing actually is the steps that you see over there. Sometimes they discover that they are using some stuff that is not useful anymore because maybe it's just a couple of users are using it and they are spending a lot of time operating it, creating it, and just uh, trying to provide new features when nobody uses it, so they try to reduce it. Sometimes they find a solution as a service or software as a service that it's better for them, it's not expensive, and they can use it uh, to, to replace the stuff that they were doing uh, and they were investing a lot of time on that. They sometimes say, OK, I'm going to migrate before being modern. So they do the lift and see. But the key point here is when you focus on modernize, you can decide if you go to replatform 
and that way you will do it with containers, or you're going to refactor, and that way you will do it in an event driving architecture using our Lambda function. You see over there that we are having different solutions for containers, even hybrid solutions in which we are providing the capacity to our customers to run containers on premise and also containers on the, in the cloud. And of course, appears also this uh, last piece that you see over there that is the platform as a service. In this case, what we are releasing is the, the ROSA service, uh, Red Hat OpenSIF on AWS. And this is because when we are talking to our customers, we see that most of the time, our CIOs, CEOs, they say, I'm investing a lot of time in working or creating the platform that I will use to create my applications. And I'm not focusing in my applications. I'm not fo focusing in the added value that I want to create to my customers and to my service. And this is something that we need to fix. Because when you need to create your own Kubernetes platform, if you are doing it yourself, then you are in a, in, a, in a trouble, you know? Because sometimes, I mean, when we are talking about enterprise, we are not doing uh, IKEA furniture, right? We are not taking different pieces and putting it together, because after this is something that maybe we are doing at home. But when you are going to an office and you see the furniture that you have over there, it's office staff, professional staff, professional fit, uh, furniture. So the difference is key. I mean, this is not something that you need to create. If you have tools that are already doing this for you, you need to be a professional with your business, and you need to, you need to do it using a professional tool, in this case, a platform as a service, which all the pieces integrate. You all know OpenSIF, so I'm not going to talk in deep here about OpenSIF. But the key difference is that we are not doing a building block solution, just trying to integrate anything. So when we are thinking about this, and we are talking about the alliance that we have with Red Hat, it's key to understand that having all these pieces together and working integrated, is, it's really key. What we are doing is a natural way, a natural uh, roadmap from the self-managed solution with OpenSIF that you can run it even on premise. Then you can run that self-managed solution also in the cloud, in AWS. Red Hat was selling the, their own uh, managed service solution with uh, OpenSea dedicated. That was transparent to the customer, but was running on top of AWS. But the relevant thing now is we have a new solution. Everything is integrated. It's a joint managed service. It's like OpenSea dedicated with a new flavor, because actually we are providing from AWS support to the infrastructure and to the integration with that infrastructure. And Red Hat is providing support to the platform as a service, to the solution that is running on top. Okay? And that said, I'm going to pass this now to, uh, to my colleague, Sai, and we are going to see a, a little demo. All right, don't worry, Javier is going to be coming back on. But uh, it's time for the demo. And just want to kind of recap a little bit. I think the, the, the way that Rosa is operated and managed, we're going to dive a little bit more into detail there. But I think it's a model that works really well. And, and that's because you know, even looking at the roadmap presentation earlier, it's very clear there's a lot of complexities that are associated with managing OpenShift. Yes, of course, with all of the tools and services that make OpenShift easier to run, a lot of that is easier than bare vanilla Kubernetes, but there's still a level of complexity. And so right now what I want to do is kick off a demo. I want to show you what the Rosa experience looks like. And it's an experience that starts in the console, in the AWS console. Uh, and for better or worse, I'll say that this is about the extent of which it's integrated into the console today. Uh, I think OpenShift users like OpenShift and OpenShift-esque consoles and user experiences. So when you start in the console, you really just have to click one button, you enable the service, and then immediately you'll notice it says download CLI. And the first thing it'll do is it'll take you to a Red Hat documentation page. Uh, let's quickly check that the Ethernet is connected here. I think we are good. Well, luckily, I have it open in another tab. Uh, regardless, you can see here that it's pretty straightforward. It's a one, two, three, four step. You download the CLI. You make sure that uh, you're kind of logged in. And you know, I'm so confident that this demo is going to work today. And that's partly because Rosa has this amazing command. It's called Rosa init. And what this does is essentially make sure that the system is ready. It's ready to create a cluster. You have the right quotas in place. Uh, I ran the command twice, but just I wanted to zoom in a little bit. You can kind of see it right here. What it's doing is it, it logs in uh, with my username and validates the credentials, make sure I have the quota, the, the policies are in place. Now, folks, I know that if you're like me, working with AWS, one of the things that trips you up 
probably is making sure all your IAM policies are in place. And so I think this experience, it just ensures that all the permissions are set correctly. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling ready about this demo right now. So what I'm going to do is create a cluster using the Rosa CLI. And it's very straightforward. I will quickly point out that the dash dash STS, this is uh, the security token service from AWS that makes sure that the service is created securely. Obviously, Rosa needs a lot of permissions. And so the, uh, the cluster itself is going to need to call uh, APIs of, of AWS on my behalf. So it, it makes sure that all of that is running correctly. So um, let's say Rosa demo comments. It's too long. There we go. So uh, pick something a little shorter. We pick the OpenShift version. Now what I'm going to do is walk, through, walk you through some of the different options that, that'll uh, kind of give me. So it's using the ARNs that I've already created. External ID, this is for if you have a special account uh, where you need a, a custom account ID. Uh, operator roles, prefixes are some more permissions, things for Rosa to have access uh, to AWS. Here's the cool one. You can actually deploy Rosa across multiple availability zones. When we talk about DR strategy, this is going to be the best possible approach for a majority of uh, customers. The chance that you know, uh, when we look at a, a deployment across multiple availability zones, you get that you know, uh, high availability that, that a lot of industries and customers need. Keep going here. Let's pick a region that we want to deploy it in. Uh, don't worry, folks. We're all almost done through this uh, set of uh, kind of prompts here. A private link cluster. Say you wanted to have a cluster that's not exposed to the public internet, workloads that can run within the context of their cluster without needing to reach out or have services reach in. Um, and of course, if you do need to access certain services, there's a number of AWS services that have private link endpoints. Essentially make sure traffic doesn't go on public pipes. Um, kind of going forward here, do you want to install into an existing VPC? Let's just say no, we'll create a new one. Uh, customer managed key. If you want to use a custom key for encrypting data, you could, you could uh, choose that right there. Choose the compute nodes. A lot of options here. Let's choose M5X large auto scaling. Now, uh, you can actually configure this automatically here. So essentially, it'll automatically scale up the nodes uh, in, in response to load. And there's some default parameters that are set there. Two compute nodes by default, some CIDR block information. Uh, it's a question for if you want to encrypt etcd data. Etcd data is already encrypted. And by the way, this terminal is so cool. If I want some more information, I can just hit the question mark, and it'll tell me a little bit more about what exactly it's doing. So by default, it is already encrypted. It's kind of an additional encryption on top. So we'll go with the default there. Uh, workload monitoring. This is if you don't want Red Hat SREs to see your application logs. Uh, and there we go. And it's going to start creating that cluster. Now, we went through a lot of different options there. What if I wanted to do that again in the future and change just one option? It gives me the entire command. So in the future, I could just copy that, change the command a little bit, and, and redeploy it. Uh, I think that's one of the, I think, cool things about this kind of interface. All right, let's jump back to the console. Now, something that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with here is the Red Hat Hybrid Cloud Console, allowing you to see clusters across a number of different environments. So here, let's click on uh, the clusters itself, which is going to launch into the OpenShift dashboard specifically. And so I created a cluster uh, last week that I'm going to use for the demo today. By the way, that one that we just created, we already see it in the console, and it's installing. But we're not going to wait for that today. We're going to switch over to the cluster that I've already created. Um, and here, we can see a few things. Now, first off, I think this is what I was saying about how, although this is OpenShift running on AWS, it's the same familiar OpenShift console and experience uh, that you know. And so here, we can see the cluster. We can do things like updating the version. I won't go into too much detail here, because again, OpenShift is OpenShift. Uh, but there is one thing that I want to quickly show here. If we go to the add-ons tab, there's some really interesting things here. Today, there's only three, but I think there's a lot of potential with what Red Hat and AWS can do together here with these add-ons. For example, there's the cluster logging operator. And if we go into the configuration here, we can see that uh, I installed it saying I wanted to stream logs to AWS CloudWatch. 
and collect application logs, infrastructure logs. And in fact, if I go to my CloudWatch console, of course, I'll need to do a little login again because it's uh, invalidated. So we'll give that a second. So if we go to CloudWatch, we'll see that the logs have actually started streaming into uh, CloudWatch from my cluster. I can go to my log insights. Let's um, make sure I'm in the right region. Love it, the internet's working great. We'll pick all my log groups, we'll run a quick query, and boom, we can see the logs coming directly from my cluster. For example, I can open up one of these and we can see that this particular container is running in Rosa demo uh, and it's the IP controller manager. But there you go. That's the first part of the demo here. I'm going to switch back to the slides here and I want to quickly talk about a few things and then we'll kick into the next one. So when we look at the number of options that are available on AWS for running compute as a whole, it really comes down to a matter of speed versus flexibility versus whether or not the platform is opinionated. Uh, and so what we can kind of see here is that the most opinionated is going to be kind of a serverless approach. Really the only thing you're uh, worrying about there is application code. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have things like EC2, which have ultimate flexibility. In fact, you can run OpenShift yourself on EC2 if you want, and a number of customers do that. Uh, but when we talk about containers specifically, when we look at something like ECS, EKS, now there's a number of solutions on AWS that support you know, things like automating, uh, automating like the delivery uh, with EKS blueprints, things like App Mesh for um, uh, kind of worrying about uh, kind of service level networking. Uh, there's container registry, there's a number of solutions, but with Rosa, what you get is a turnkey application platform and that is, uh, it's, it's kind of baked into the platform itself. And so I want to quickly talk about what that means for uh, users. So again, with EKS, we saw that landscape slide. Tons of solutions in the CNCF. You know, you can use uh, GitHub, Jenkins, you can use Istio, you can plug and play with all of these solutions, and you can get, you know, exactly what you're looking for. And this is very powerful. But for many customers, and I think this is a very kind of powerful image here, you flip the switch here and you realize Red Hat provides baked in, supported, blessed solutions for basically uh, kind of all of the things that you see up there. And they're based on open source technologies. And I think this is a very powerful message for customers that need that opinionated approach when building a complete Kubernetes application platform. And so I think one thing that I really want to talk about here, I, we mentioned it a few times already, is What's, what's the support model? Who's responsible for what? Because when you're managing OpenShift on your, uh, by yourself, or even on AWS running on something like EC2, you're actually responsible for quite a bit. The control plane, the data plane, as well as the compute itself. Uh, and of course, support and billing will come through Red Hat. Now the model, the difference with Rosa is that you have Red Hat SREs that actually manage that compute, data plane, and control plane. They're in the back end, and they're making sure things run smoothly. When you open a support ticket, you can open it against AWS or Red Hat. And of course, billing is going to be coming through AWS. I think this is kind of critical to understand that Rosa is this kind of fully managed approach to running OpenShift. Now, of course, today we, talk, uh, we were talking about modernization of applications. What we see here is that there's a number of services on AWS. Really, this is the bread and butter of AWS. It's, it's what we do well. We have so many services that allow you to do things from storage to CI, CD for storing containers, uh, a central managed service. Now, of course, a lot of these things, customers may choose to run them within cluster. But also, when you're looking at a bigger scope, when you're running multiple clusters in production, you may want to have a managed service centrally that handles some of these things. And so that's what I want to talk about in my next demo here. I want to show exactly how easy it is to work directly with AWS from within your uh, clusters. So going back to my cluster here, um, let's see. I was actually on the right page. I'm going to open the console. Uh, and so what I'm doing is launching into my OpenShift cluster, my Rosa cluster on AWS. I'm going to go to operators and go to the operator hub. And I'm just going to search Amazon. 
And what we see here is a number of operators for AWS controllers for Kubernetes. This allows us to operate AWS from within OpenShift. This is pretty powerful. So let me scroll down here. Let me find one of these. Uh, let's say RDS, and we'll hit install. And we'll see that it gives me the uh, option to go through here and install this operator into my cluster. And notably, and I think OpenShift does a great job of this, is it shows me the APIs that become exposed. What can I actually do once this operator is installed? So let's go to my installed operators. I've set up the S3 operator. And I want to create a bucket. So we'll say create bucket. And we'll name this bucket um, uh, commons demo one. And then the name of the bucket itself actually needs to be completely unique. So uh, there we go. Seems random enough. And we'll hit create, keeping all the other defaults. All right. So let's take a look. We'll click the bucket, make sure there's no errors, make sure I didn't mess anything up. Resource synced successfully. Jump to my S3 console. I'm in the right region already. There we go. And just like that, I was able to get a bucket created using a uh, Kubernetes-based artifact. That is, I'm, I'm able to work with AWS using a CRD within Kubernetes. I think this is very powerful. And of course, uh, if you wanted to take the information from that actual uh, deployed cluster. Of course, I lost it. Here we go. And say I wanted to pass in something like the location into a config map or secret so that my containers could access it. Uh, you can do that fairly easily. It's just another CRD, just another resource you deploy into Kubernetes. I really wanted to show this today because it shows that you know, with OpenShift running on AWS, you're able to actually integrate and operate services running within AWS as well. All right, that's my demo for today. I'm going to pass it back to the slides. And Javier's got a couple more that he wants to share with you. OK. So that was a really good content, really good demo. Uh, finally, we want to talk about which is the consumption-based pricing. Of course, when we are talking about uh, OpenShift self-managed, uh, you will see that the price is uh, much cheaper when you go to a managed service solution. Actually, you have to. Uh, dimensioning in the proper way, but you need to understand which uh, stuff you're going to pay and which part of the price that you are paying is mapped to any of the, of the stuff that you see over there. First, there's some ROSA services fees, and these fees are compelling or competing to the, work, uh, uh, to the worker nodes. Actually, uh, every four CPUs, you are paying a, a price for the, for, the, for the fee in that uh, workload, uh, worker node uh, infrastructure. So it depends on the kind of instance that you are using. I mean, if you need to use for your worker, uh, for your workloads in that, in that nodes uh, more capacity, then you are paying more. It depends on the dimension that you are doing. And also, you have to pay a, a little fee for the control plane. That actually, you will see in the public prices that is a ridiculous price for, for that. And then, of course, you have to pay for the infrastructure that you are going to use for the control plane and also for the workers. The good news is that the the same way that you are paying for one year, up to three years for the subscriptions with Red Hat, you have a similar model. So if you acquire compromise for, for ROSA for one to three years, the price will be changing. And of course, if you are, if you are going to use it for, for more years, it's going to be a, a cheaper. But um, the, the, the pricing is really simple. If you go to the, to the to the internet and you just write ROSA pricing, you will see different uh, examples with different uh, control planes, different worker nodes, and so on. And it's uh, really useful. Um, my last slide, can you pass it there? Because this is not working, please, Sai. That's why I'm here. It's just to talk about the alliance. This is not something that we are just creating now for ROSA. I mean, we have been working with the AWS for many years now. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, workloads and different solutions on top of AWS. Red Hat is using a lot of stuff on top of us. In fact, you have to understand that the first managed service that they were creating, OpenShift dedicated, was directly on top of AWS. And what they say, my, my colleagues and my peers from, from, from Red Hat DBDs, they say, you know, the first stuff of the, that we are testing for new releases and the first cloud in which we are testing everything is AWS. So I think that is a natural step in the growing of a managed service to go to AWS with ROSA 
for that integration with OpenSIF in a joint managed service with AWS in order that we can provide a better service and, and a, a better solution to our customers. And that's all that we have for today. We hope that was uh, really interesting for you and hopefully see you around uh, during the, the next days here. Thank you. Thank you.